This morning we're going to get into some more of the meat, the meat of the word. We're looking at Acts 7. I'm going to read verses 44 through 60 and chapter 8, verse 1a, the first part of verse 1. Our fathers had the tabernacle of testimony in the wilderness. Just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern which he had seen. And having received in it their turn, our fathers brought it in with Joshua upon dispossessing the nations whom God drove out before our fathers until the time of David. And David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers <clears throat> and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. I want to stop there. You know, back in chapter 6 and verse 13, they accused Stephen of speaking against the holy place, meaning the temple, and the Jewish house of worship, which is what it was. So here in Stephen's sermon, he again reminds them of the history of the temple to show his respect for it because it was ordained by God. And he begins in a period before the temple, of course, with the tabernacle, as directed by Moses, to put together and so that this generation that he's talking to could not plead ignorance to God's glory because it was with them. And they in turn brought it with them to the time of Joshua and that period of history with the battles that they fought and their victories and their losses. And as time and time again, they would fall into idolatry, this Israel nation. But the tabernacle would remain with them until the time of David's reign. The wilderness generation could not plead ignorance to God's presence with them. In verse 46, after David was given many victories over all his enemies, 2 Samuel 7 says that he asked God that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. And as you recall, David's request was denied because he was considered a man of blood. But his son, Solomon, would be allowed to build a house for God. And as beautiful as Solomon's temple was, Stephen doesn't spend much time talking about it here, does he, in detail? Because his audience already knew it. They already knew what that temple was like with its history. And the current temple that they have was not Solomon's temple because it was destroyed by the Babylonians in Ezra 5.12. And the temple was replaced by one built by Zerubbabel, which had been destroyed as well. And the current one was built by a non-Jew, Herod. And years later in 70 AD, it would be destroyed as well. So Stevens makes his point here in verse 48 that the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. And then to back up his statement here, he quotes the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 66, 1. And that's verse 49 and, 40 and 50 in your text. Here's, it's capitalized because he's quoting him, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool for my feet. What kind of house would you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose, or his position and his place? Was it not my hand which made all these things? So he's bringing to their attention again God's majesty and his glory, 
Stephen was not guilty of blaspheming the temple as they accused him. They were for confining it to God, the temple. Instead, with Solomon and Isaiah, he argued that God was greater than any temple. The temple was a symbol of God's presence, yes, and he agrees with that, but not a prison of his essence. You see, they went to the temple and they were with God, but the rest of the time they weren't with him. They did whatever they pleased as long as they were working their salvation and doing things to please people and themselves. And as you might imagine, the tension <laughs> in this crowd that Stephen's speaking to must have been building rapidly. And as he pointed out, Israel's rejections and their apostasies are falling away. The Sanhedrin must have begun to get real uneasy by this time in his talk. And notice nothing's happened. They're still listening to him. And since Stephen had given the historical disobedient past, he now gives his verdict of them. His verdict of them in 51 and 53. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You're not doing, you're doing just as your fathers did, he said. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They persecuted all of them. And they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one. He's referring to Jesus, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels, yet did not keep it. He calls them some names here. Stiff-necked. They're refusing to bow down before the Lord. They would not humble themselves before God. And he calls them uncircumcised in their hearts and ears. Oh, they could brag that we are of the circumcision. We are the Jews, and we've been circumcised, so therefore we're God's holy chosen people. But their lives didn't represent that at all. Their heart and ears, what they heard, meant nothing to them. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't change. They were still unclean before God, like the Gentiles. They wouldn't listen to the prophets, nor the righteous one, Jesus Christ. And so they had become Jesus' betrayers. Stephen's saying, and Jesus murderers, while taking pride in themselves that they received the law as ordained by angels. And Peter said, or not Peter, Stephen says, you did not keep it. You didn't keep it. They're getting ready to commit another murder, aren't they? Look in 54 through 60. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. And they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and they rushed upon him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they went on stoning Stephen as he called upon the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. Here in this passage, Stephen is murdered because only Rome could have enforced capital punishment. And here we see a very different contrast, don't we? Stephen and this council that ran out to kill him. On one side, Stephen's looking to heaven. These other guys are talking and thinking hellish. They're being mean and hateful, evil. Stephen is filled with the Spirit. They are filled with hate, anger, rage, because they want him stopped now. they got to have him stopped. He's pointing out too many things they know is true. That's why they want to kill him. 
Stephen's full of spiritual sight. They're spiritually blind. They refuse to see it. Stephen's full of life. They're full of death. Stephen's full of love. And they're full of hate. What a picture in these verses. They were cut to the quick, Luke says. They were cut to the quick. Literally, that means to be sawn in half. That's what that word means in the Greek. They were sawn in half. They were absolutely livid. It's like Stephen's words ripped the veneer of their fake spirituality off from them. So everybody could see what they really are like now. They're blasphemous hypocrites that they were. They were far from being broken by repentance. They were ready to kill him. No remorse, only rage and ready to kill him with what they had in their hand. And they picked up stones and by their law they could take him out to the edge of the city and kill him. The Sanhedrin had heard the truth. They had heard Jesus' teaching. And they had witnessed his miracles. They had heard the preaching of the apostles and saw the miracles that they were able to perform through the Lord. And because of their continual rejection, Stephen did not give them another invitation. Guys, if you'll just repent, if you'll just come back. No, that's done. And this is the first episode and the last. This is the last time they're given that opportunity. And what does he give them? An indictment. One that filled them with rage. Stephen's sermon was God's final testimony to Israel. This is it. You guys have had your chance all these years. So now we're going to take the gospel to the Gentiles as well. Yes, you can repent and yes, you can change, but it's your choice. Your choice. Stephen stoning was Israel's final rejection of Christ. Here again, they're doing the same thing they did to Jesus, only he was crucified. Now they're stoning Stephen. They lied to get him there. And even though he's told them the truth, they kill him. In fact, Jerusalem would fall in 70 AD. Rome would take over because of this. Because of their attitude, their behavior. You remember that they tried to stone Jesus in John 8, 58. And you remember he just hid and walked through the crowd. They were going to do the same thing to him back then. Look again at verse 55 and 56. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Why was Jesus not sitting? He welcomed Stephen home. Jesus stood up to welcome him home. Stephen's eyes were opened by God to see the Shekinah glory that revealed Jesus standing at God's right hand. He was the first person to see Jesus before Paul or John in his glorified body, in his glorified state, after his ascension. Stephen was. And when Stephen used that title, the Son of Man, they did not want to hear that again. Jesus always referred to himself as the Son of Man. That was his favorite title, and it's used so many times in the New Testament. That made them live it. They covered their ears, and they began to go get him. That struck the proverbial dagger into their hearts. Because that was the title that Jesus the Christ used. And that brought back the memories. Those wonderful memories of crucifying Jesus Christ. Lying, betraying him. His murder. So they covered their ears. And they grab him. And they take him out of the city to stone him. And they lay their robes at the feet of this young man named Saul. Who we know later became Paul. What they did was against the law, but uh, at that period of time, Pilate would have ignored it because he didn't want any more trouble with the Jews. So he let it happen. They knew it was going on. And notice Stephen cries out with what Jesus said from the cross. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He was so close. He felt like that. 
The only exception is that Jesus committed himself to his father. But Stephen commits himself to the Lord Jesus in this time of terror and pain. That confession of Stephen's indicates that he absolutely expected to enter the Lord's presence as soon as he died. As soon as he died. The Bible does not teach any delay at all between life here and in heaven. Either some hiding place, such as a purgatory, or some unconscious state called a soul sleep that I've read about and heard about. Instead, it teaches that a believer enters Christ's presence immediately, following death. 2 Corinthians 5.8 talks about that, and Philippians 1.23 talk about that. Our Lord, you remember, promised the thief on the cross that today you will be with me in paradise in Luke 23, 43. And in his parables of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, 19 through 31, he taught that the dead are never unconscious or unaware of their circumstances. Revelation 6, 9 through 11 describes the tribulation of the martyrs, you remember, as they awake from this divine presence and able to plead with the Lord. They're awake and they're talking to the Lord. Hey, when, when are we going to have vengeance for what, what we've went through? That doesn't sound to me like a soul sleep to you, to you either, does it? They're awake. And Stephen falling on his knees, crying out in a loud voice, there in verse 60, a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Who does that sound like? Jesus, doesn't it? From the cross, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus from the cross. Stephen is filled with the Spirit. I mean full and running over. And he still loves them. He still loves them as they're hitting him with rocks, the Scripture says. He's aware of it. While they were stoning him, he calls upon this. That's love. That's grace. Grace in, in a picture there. You can see it. He loved him even that much. His faith and devotion. Luke records that he fell asleep. The end of this verse 60. He fell asleep. What a peaceful, calm way to slip into eternity in the Lord's presence. Sleep. It's a lovely way to describe the death of a believer. Sleep. It's painless and temporary. And it takes us from one experience of weariness and work and consciousness of all the problems that we deal with <sighs> to a fresh new day, a new beginning. It's all in the past. It's gone. And perhaps hearing those words, I'm sure Stephen heard, well done, <laughs> good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. And then in verse 1 of chapter 8, and you can see if your Bible has that, the A in this first and is not capitalized or not black or dark, which means it's part of chapter 7. And Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Saul. He's all part of it. He's gun ho He's excited about it. And as we'll go on in Acts, we'll find out how he began persecuting Christians. I mean, he got, his, he got it going right there. And yet he comes to Christ later on, doesn't he? I want you to keep in mind three truths from this text today. Number one, Stephen's sermon was God's final testimony to Israel. They've had it. They've had it a long, long time. Years and years and years and years, hundreds of years. That's going to stop now. This gospel is going to start going everywhere. In fact, because of this incident here, the church spreads. It goes out. It goes all over the world because of what happened here. Number two, Stephen stoning was Israel's final rejection of Christ. Their final rejection of Christ. Okay. The Lord gets the message. He understands. They'd rather pretend than be real. And number three, expect a great welcome in heaven. 
we can all expect a great welcome in heaven when we go to be with the Lord? What an honor, what a privilege. Expect a great welcome, like Stephen did. Jesus will be there to welcome us, everybody. Those who have received him as their Savior, those who have received him as their Lord, repented from their sins and gave their lives to Christ. What a welcome we're going to receive in heaven. And there's a picture of it right there with Stephen, this whole thing. This morning, there's a lot of things to think about and chew on about this passage about Israel. And we're going to look into that more as Saul begins to persecute the church. But if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and repented of your sins, which isn't popular today, I don't know if you know that, a lot of churches don't want to talk about repenting of your sins. We want to talk about receiving the Lord, but we don't want to talk about repenting. But that is the gospel, repentance, a change of heart, a change of direction. Uh, people just want to add Jesus to their life and not make a change. That don't work. Repentance is a part of that. Repent of your sins. Confess him as your Savior and Lord. Be identified with him. Say, yes, I'm a believer through baptism and immersion. Submitting to that. This morning, please take that step of faith, if you haven't already, to follow him. We don't know when our time's coming. Uh, nobody does. Even in a hospital, you never know. Sometimes the doctors know more than we do, and they don't want to tell us. But be ready in an instant to go be with the Lord and have that welcome. You know, when you pass away in your new life, and come to Christ and he welcomes you with open arms as he did Stephen. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Lord, for these truths this morning that Stephen's expressed through his sermon, his teaching. And Father, we pray that not like the Sanhedrin, we accept this. This is the gospel. This is the truth. We know, Lord, you love us. We know that you died for us. We know that you paid the penalty for our sins. You wiped our debt free, totally. And Father, we pray that you'll help us. And if those there's someone here this morning that's never made that commitment, I pray, Lord, you'd speak to their heart, that they say, yeah, it's time to repent of my sins and to ask Jesus in my heart, accept him as my Lord and Savior, and to walk in his steps. What an example Stephen is for us to walk in your steps, to quote the phrases that you, you quoted from the cross, to show mercy and grace to those who were picking up stones and killing him, and he loved them through it. Father, help us to have that kind, that kind of grace and love and mercy that you show us every day. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our invitation hymn this morning is 388, where he leads him out, follow the first and last verse. Let's stand together, 388.